Carol Giambavo. Carol is on the focus committee and is a former member of the CAN board. Uh, sitting next to Carol is my colleague and fellow CAN board member, Rachel Andrus. Um, and sitting next to Rachel is Ron Taggart. Ron is also on the focus committee. And Ron's the publisher of the Focus newsletter, and we can thank Ron for these fabulous name tags that we're all wearing. Um, <laughs> sitting next to Ron is Heather Svoboda. Heather is a member of the Free Minds affiliate and is the Focus Conference co-chair, along with Rick Seelhoff. And Rick is also on the focus committee. And sitting next to Rick, I can hardly see him, but down at the far end is Doug Augustin, president of Free Minds and the conference co-chair, along with his wife, Linnell, who was supposed to be sitting next to him, but I, I think she's sitting at the registration desk. So if you could give them all a round of applause. Before we start the luncheon program, I wanted to take a couple minutes to talk to you about CAN's Nardic program. Um, most of you have probably noticed that many of us in this room are wearing enamel pins that have original artwork on it by a former cult member, and the artwork is called Mind Control Masterpiece. These pins are worn by NARDIC members. NARDIC, which stands for National Resource and Development Council, was founded in 1986 by Harry Stanton, and it's a way for people interested in helping to ensure CAN's future by making a long-term financial commitment to CAN. Members make a $1,000 a year pledge for three years. Some, members, some people split memberships. When Nardic was originally founded, the goal was to get 100 members, and in the few years since it's been founded, we're halfway there, which I'm very pleased to announce. Um, I also wanted to let you know there are many ways to fulfill the Nardic commitment, and if any of you are interested, please see a CAN board member or a Nardic member. Um, I joined Nardic because after I left the destructive cult that I was in, which was Church Universal and Triumphant, CAN was there to provide me and my family with support services, and I'd have to say that all of you in this room helped me put my life back together. When I became more financially secure, I wanted to give back to the organization that has given me so much. Being a Nardic member is my way of thanking you all for all that you've done for the thousands of people, of families, former members, like myself. So I just wanted to thank you. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce Carol Giambalvo now. But before I do, I wanted to let you know that Dr. Singer will only be taking questions in writing, and there will be people who will be um, picking up the questions. So if you just raise your hand if you have a question for her, then someone will pick up the slip of paper. Thank you. It's my extreme pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Margaret Singer, uh, who is going to address uh, the issue of coping with post-cult trauma. Dr. Singer is Emeritus Adjunct Professor of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and is considered the world's leading expert on cults and thought reform, having spent three decades researching, writing, and serving as court expert, as well as counseling with former cult members. She is the author of many, many scholarly papers on the subject. After receiving her PhD, Dr. Singer spent six years at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, working with Dr. Louis J. West, Dr. Robert J. Lifton, and Dr. Edgar Schein on a study of coercive persuasion and thought reform on prisoners of war, as well as civilian internees in China. Dr. Singer serves on the editorial board of a number of professional journals. She is the recipient of the following awards. 
the prestigious National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Award. Awards for research from the American Psychiatric Association, the American Mental Health Association, American Family Therapy Association, as well as the Leo J. Ryan Award from the Cult Awareness Network. In addition, she was the first woman and the first PhD to become the president of the American Psychosomatic Society. She was a member of a select committee appointed by the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine to survey the health effects of mustard gas and lewisite. She wrote the chapter on post-traumatic stress disorders for the book which resulted from this study and was recently published by the National Academy Press. I could spend the next half hour extolling Dr. Singer's professional accomplishments. A very impressive list indeed. Equally impressive to me, however, is Dr. Singer's humility and warmth. Through her clinical, her academic, and her legal work, she has been a direct help to hundreds of recovering former cult members. In doing that work, she has exhibited patience, respect, understanding, and compassion, and a very strong sense of justice to form a cultist in need of regaining their self-respect, their dignity, and their own self-image. Hers has been the loudest, strongest message of advocacy on behalf of form cultists, and that is, don't blame the victim. With the utmost With utmost respect and affection, I introduce Dr. Margaret Singer. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Such a warm welcome makes up for a lot of other things that happen in life. Thank you so much. <laughs> Back in the mid-1970s, Dr. John Clark, Dr. L.J. West, and I were among the first mental health professionals to call attention to the psychological status of persons emerging from cults. Ours were clinical observations based upon interviewing and providing psychoeducational consultation to ex-cultists. We worked independently. I was in California, Dr. West was down in LA, and Jack Clark was in Massachusetts. I only met Dr. Clark after we had had many phone conversations discussing the many hundreds of former members each of us had worked with. I had heard of Jack Clark and his work and phoned him one day to discuss what each of us had noticed. That was informational, inspiring, and the start of discussions that continued sporadically until his retirement a few years ago. And again, as I said, also in the mid-70s, Dr. Louis J. West and I uh, once again got called together to take a look at the reemergence of coercive persuasion and thought reform in the Patty Hearst case. And since that time, uh, have both of us stayed very active in uh, being of aid in educating, hopefully, the mental health professions and in offering help and counsel to former cultists. So those early observations were all clinical observations that being in a cult was not necessarily for the welfare growth and mental health of the members because uh, doctors West, Clark, and I were offering clinical consultation and help to help people understand what some of the practices of their groups had induced in them. Luckily, people have now started doing more detailed surveys. And for example, the lowest estimates run down 
of how many people who come out of cults need some type of counseling and mental health work. And I'm going to give you a quick summary. The lowest estimate is that the 36% of people needing help came from work that Mark Gallanter did and with a very uh, biased sample of Farmer Moonies who on the whole had been funneled to him through the management. And even under those circumstances, he said, 36% of those who had emerged had serious emotional problems after leaving. Had he seen a more free sample like the rest of us do, the estimate might be up closer to the following estimates. Levine in 1984 said that in a large survey that he sampled of around 800, that 50% showed emotional upheaval severe enough to warrant treatment during the first few months after they leave a cult. Otis, in surveying 2,000 transcendental meditators, found consistent patterns of adverse effects, and he concluded that the number and severity of these adverse effects correlated with the longer duration of meditation. Conway and Siegelman found that 52% of the people they studied who had been in cults experience floating, and in a minute we'll get into what floating means, and they found that 35% were unable to break the mental schedules of chanting, that they couldn't stop chanting even though they'd left the cult and intended to stop. Lisman and Tannenbaum found that 60% of the people they studied that were former cultists received counseling after leaving. and. Um, Recently, Swartling in uh, Sweden reported that 50% of the people she had studied had psychotic-like symptoms upon leaving, and that 25% of the group uh, that she studied had attempted suicide. So you can see that the number of people badly affected by their times in cults is coming to be substantiated so that Dr. Clark and Dr. West and I and those of you that have been here in this group all these years were not crying wolf, we were pointing a finger rather quietly and subtly at uh, remarkable amounts of difficulties people had after leaving modern day cults. So after interviewing and working with over 3,000 former cultists I have, with uh, Richard Offshe joining in to analyze some of the data, have concluded that almost all people coming out of cults suffer from a form of anomie for some period, <coughs> pardon me, for some period of time after leaving. This is the dealing with how to integrate three cultures. The culture you lived in before you joined the cult, the culture you lived while you were in the cult, and the third culture adapting now that you're out in the world. So that this sense of anime is the experiencing of who am I among that collection of three sets of value systems that have to somehow be dealt with. The second most prominent thing that I found in people emerging from cults, and particularly ones that have been in a long time, is developmental lags in their social uh, and experiential lives with a need for a gradual re-entry into dating, into trying to re-enter complicated work, trying to return to college. And often I have to work with families and relatives and even the ex-cultist to give the person enough time. It doesn't have to be a great deal of time universally, but enough time that they can pull themselves together in various ways before attempting really complicated mental and social and business enterprises. And uh, I have both a pathetic and an amusing story of three young people I worked with some years ago that uh, when they came out they were in the Berkeley area and they decided they were going to take advice and do a very low level job for a few weeks to a few months to get healthy and get their minds squared away. 
And one of them went out into uh, one of the rural areas and was working as a dock loader, putting big sacks of potatoes on the truck. And he called me and said, Dr. Singer, you know, I'm just spacing out. I keep loading these sacks on and I float out somewhere and I'm really not paying attention to loading these sacks of potatoes. I'm floating out into meditating again. And I got complaints from two others that went into highly routine jobs loading a lumber truck and a paint truck. And that cued me long ago to start looking at what were some of the impacts on people of these highly repetitive chanting, etc., activities they did in cults. And so across time, I've sort of grouped cults in the following ways that no one cult just specializes in using dissociative producing techniques, nor in doing high emotional arousal. They all use blends of those, but you can sort of group them as more one way than the other. Now, the groups that tend to produce the most dissociative problems when people emerge from cults are the empty mind or mantra meditation groups, the groups that use guided imagery, past lives, and various dissociative routines such as trance dancing, spinning, rocking, and speaking in tongues. These groups tend to produce what's called often relaxation-induced anxiety, or RIA. And it's been known in uh, professional literature for quite some time that not everybody responds well to trance or hypnotic inductions. Not everybody responds well to closed eye progressive relaxation. And early writers such as Otis began to comment that uh, not all long-term meditators were doing well. And the people studying primarily the progressive relaxation mantra meditation and uh, certain forms of hypnotic induction started writing about what they were calling relaxation-induced anxiety. And there are kind of three kinds of effects that come into people that indulge in these programs that are primarily dissociative producing. The first are that people who have done a lot of those dissociative techniques have a lot of sensory problems. They have, for example, sensations of floating, heaviness, tingling, numbness, heat or cold feelings. And the physiologists who have studied these say that they feel that it's probably a shift toward parasympathetic nervous system dominating during these periods of, uh, or states induced by uh, the closed eye, et cetera, things. So those were the sensory experiences, and many people that are here at the focus meeting have shared with me the kinds they've had. The second kind of relaxation-induced anxieties are motor in nature, in which there are body jerks, tics, spasms, twitches, and uncontrollable restlessness, or bursts, which resemble something like minor panic attacks in which the person feels their heart's racing, their palms are sweaty, and they're all ready to leave but cannot leave the situation. The third type of flooding into people that have been in these uh, dissociative producing cult practices are what I call cognitive and affective flooding in which people will without cues and triggers from the environment, suddenly feel very, very sexual, very, very aggressive, very, very angry. There's just a flooding without cues of some kind of emotion turn on. So that these are some of the prices that get paid for being in a group that teaches you how to spend many, many hours a day many days per month over many years doing dissociative exercises. So that the uh, RIA ticks, panic attacks, 
This is the definition that's going to be in DSM-4 that's coming out pretty soon. And there are many people in this room that have experienced discrete panic attacks after coming out of cultic groups in which they felt they've had uh, any uh, group of four of the following 12 features. A discrete period of intense fear or discomfort in which any four of the following symptoms developed abruptly and reached a peak within about 10 minutes. Pounding heart, sweating, trembling or shaking, shortness of breath or a feeling of smothering, a feeling of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or abdominal distress, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded or faint, feelings of derealization in which the surroundings don't feel, feel real, they don't seem real briefly, or depersonalization experiences where the person feels detached from themselves and as if they're looking at themselves as an object. Um, fear of losing control or going crazy, fear of dying, numbness, tingling, and hot and cold flashes. So that <clears throat> those people that have been in primarily the mantra and repetitive and dissociative uh, producing cultic groups tend to have dissociative features, panic attacks, the RIA, cognitive inefficiencies, meaning after many years of prolonged speaking in tongues, chanting, spin dancing, learning how to dissociate, people report that they have a great deal of trouble paying attention, concentrating, they complain something's wrong with their attention, concentration, and memory. Those of you who are sitting here and feeling, oh my gosh, I've got everything she's talking about. <laughs> Don't worry. It eventually all goes away. It's a matter of time. Learning to label what's happening and getting some real good psychoeducational explanations including physiological and others of what it is that's happening. Um, the emotional arousal groups, these tend to be more like the Bible-based groups in which the group focuses on arousing fear and guilt. After leaving, these people describe feeling intense and unwarranted guilt over almost anything fears over all kinds of things, intense doubting every time they go to uh, make up a decision of any kind, and some of them also have panic attacks. And those of you who are physicians here, I hope I can get you to study some of the cult people who have panic attacks that are in your nearby areas. Now, regardless of type of cult, whether it was the high emotional arousing of a negative kind primary group or primarily a empty mind meditation dissociative group, those things I wrote about in the 1979 Psychology Today article called Coming Out of the Cults are still operative today. People come out of groups and they feel depressed for many reasons. They feel lonely. They start to pro find themselves doing phobic-like constriction of their social contacts because they can't trust their own judgment and they can't trust other people. They can't trust other people because they feel so badly ripped off by what happened those many years and as the consequences of being in the uh, cult or restrictive group they were in, regardless of the practices of the group, whether it was dissociative or arousal, most people for a period of time have a fear of joining ju groups. They fear going back to their old church, their old social life, any type of group activity. Also, in many of the cults, they've learned to distrust medicine, dentistry, psychology, and learning. And one of the most poignant things is a distrust of the self because many people start blaming themselves, saying, 
why ever did I join? In which part of exit counseling, part of psychoeducational work afterwards is helping people come to analyze that step at a time influence program and deception that led them into various groups and what the situation was psychologically and socially that retained them while they were in those groups. And people that were in groups that did a lot of inducing of past lives memories have to sort out what was real history and what was contrived from past lives, work in the cult, guided imagery, and so on. So that in summary, almost everyone coming out of cults has some form of anomie they have some developmental lags where they need to give themselves time to catch up with dating social habits. Three, many are experiencing variants of post-traumatic stress disorder in which recollection, avoidance, and arousal uh, keeps coming into their minds. Fourthly, dissociative states, and five, a variety of panic disorders. Now, last year, I had a request from the people. I gave a talk to the focus group last year, and I got many letters, as did Cynthia Kisser and um, Carol Giambalvo saying, could this year for the big public luncheon, could I go over some of the things I talked about to the focus group, because they wanted to hear it again, and they wanted it shared with other people. And I began by talking about three terms that get used frequently in the uh, post-cult life. That is triggers, flashbacks, and floating. What's a trigger? A trigger is a cue, simply a cue in your present situation or in your thinking that causes a remembrance. A flashback is the content that the trigger cues into awareness. And floating is that dissociated experiencing of the cued flashback. Floating usually is a period of feeling sort of conflicted as if you're back in the cult. You suddenly have a cue come on, you have a flashback of a memory of your time in the group, and for minutes to hours or even more than a day, a person describes feeling in this floating state, meaning they feel as if they're back in the cult, they know they're here, and they're doing a lot of inside the head attempts to decide what should they do in the here and now. Triggers are often referred to by people as if there's some mysterious arcane thing as if some word, phrase, situation, picture, odor, touch has some magical power and mysterious meaning. Quite the contrary, your old cult leader did not place a mysterious suggestion that's going to go off like a time bomb. Triggers are merely partial recalls, partial memories that we all have all the time. And the term triggered is an abbreviation of the phrase, it triggered my memory of, fill in the blank. It reminded me of when, fill in the blank. It made me think, feel, recall, re-experience certain memories from my time in the group. Memory is a process, and a recall of the past is always a construction of times past being recalled in the present time. Something going on now triggers a memory of something from the past. A number of persons erroneously think of human memory as like a videotape or a reel of movie film and that everything that ever happened to them is stored on a reel in the head and that we ought to be able to replay the past. This is incorrect and is not supported by scientific research. 
Now, what about the triggers from the totalist cultic group days? Depending upon the practices of the group, the personal experiences that a person had while they were in the group, the philosophy of the group, and conflicts the person may have had from pre-cult days, moments of speaking in tongues or prolonged periods of chanting, over-breathing, trance induction, spinning, trance dancing, rocking, produce these forms of dissociation that we've talked about. Also, many cult leaders make the followers sit and listen to endless hours of boring lectures. I talked with some of the people who had uh, been in the David Koresh branch Davidians, and they told me that Koresh had made them sit oftentimes for 15 hours of unending speaking at them and strumming on the guitar, and they had to sit there. Now, what does this do when people come out of a group? Having to sit still in a classroom, in a lecture, in a church service, in a public meeting triggers resentment toward the person that is up there controlling you. Because while you're in the cult, you can't get up and leave, as you all know. There are intense social and psychological prohibitions about complaining, getting up and leaving, and so on. So that many times, after coming out of a cult, the very sitting in a meeting calls up some triggerings of resentment that you had back in the cult, where your body got all ready to flee. You couldn't, but you're all turned on to leave, and there's the anger and resentment. And part of post-cult adaptation is to recognize that desire to flee, talk about it, and realize you really were angry as well as fearful a great deal of time in the cult. And one of the things that's astonishing over and over, even though I've heard these things so many thousands of times, no matter how high up you are in a cult, your position, your post, your role is very transient because you hold that security only momentarily. Someone higher up can pull the rug and everything that you've striven for in the cult is gone in a moment. So those people that act as if they're on top of the world in your old cult are just as anxious as you who were the underlings in the cult. Another thing that uh, people, after coming out of cults, as I said, they don't want to go sit at lectures in college, they don't want to go sit in church, they don't want to go to concerts. And sometimes, I, in working with the teenage and children of people that have been in cults a long time, a number of the children and teenagers who were made to sit for hours on end begin to pick and scratch and claw at themselves and do it surreptitiously under their clothes. They are so angry, they so want out of there. The only thing they can do is turn that anger and that charge toward themselves, so that I've worked with a lot of uh, that. Also, triggering of music clues. People will be driving along the roadway. You will hear a song that your old group used to sing with their words. Those of you that were in some of the New Age groups that highly uh, used music will begin to weep as you're driving along the roadway. Now, with those people who have dissociation. What that means is just psychological disengagement at the moment. You all know it that have ever been teachers. You look around the class and you realize some of them have spaced out. Their eyes are open but they're gone mentally. That's called dissociation. They just have signed out psychologically. They've disengaged. Survival in cults often depends on you being very good at just going out. 
But when you come out of the cult and you're in this world that moves along all the time and you have to keep making decisions and you keep spacing out, decision making is a disaster because you can't keep your mind focused long enough to keep planning ahead. Um, also, there are what we call reality testing issues after coming out of the cult. Moments of derealization in which the person will be here in this room, they'll be walking along the street, they'll be anywhere in the world, and suddenly those hours and hours over the years of thinking they had lived in past lives pops into their mind. And they have to then suddenly, while engaging in the surrounding world, try to decide, did I live back in 1561 in downtown Rome or not? Um, also, after coming out of high control groups, I've already mentioned the relaxation-induced uh, emotional states flooding on, sometimes people have so split off their anger that it's months after they come out of the cult till they're walking along the street, they're sitting somewhere, and tremendous anger floods into their awareness. And they need to be able to realize they aren't going crazy. This is a frequent response to the amount of containment, control, denial that had to be done in order to preserve yourself in the cult. Um, and when are these flashbacks, the floating, the triggering most likely to happen? And when can you prepare yourself to avoid getting wiped out by the triggering, the flashbacks and floating. When you're stressed, it's likely to happen. When you're anxious, when uncertain, when lonely, when distracted, when fatigued, and when ill. So I work with a lot of people that have these moments of just coming apart and I find out when does it happen? Often late in the day. You know, so you've got to get people planning ahead that by 3.30, they're needing to realize what should they do to become aware that when tired, a lot of this stuff is going to flood into their awareness so that it's not as distressing and uh, so on. Now, how to deal with all of these different cult-induced changes in your behavior that usually were adaptations to the type of stress, to the type of social and psychological pressure you adapted to. First, education is most important. Learning to label, this is a dissociative moment. You know, that sounds very academic, but just knowing that you just psychologically disengaged and not think that your memory is shot. And you can say to yourself, I'm not going crazy. I'm not damaged for life. This is just a momentary dissociated moment. I can pick up where I was. It's just a thought. It's just a memory. I don't have to act on it. Now, all of you practically have heard tales, and they do occur, that some single command said to a person causes them to go back to the cult. This happens the most often in certain heavy-duty uh, guilt-tripping groups where parents will come, your friends will come to visit, and they're going to take you out to dinner or to be with you for a while. And the family thinks that the cultist is coming with them. And the leader of the house or the leader of the group says, Jonathan, I want to talk with you a minute. And Jonathan does not come back out again. And if he does, he may say, Ma, Dad, I can't go with you. My mission is here. I can't go. 
and people wonder what was the magic killing. There was no magic killing. I've asked people what happened that first two or three times when people came to work with you, to take you out, to try to reconnect, and they'd say, oh, the guru or whoever said a couple of things that made me feel so guilty. They would say things such as, you're a person of your word. You gave your word to me. You cannot break your word. And they said both the kind of trance-inducing property and the guilt and the fear flooded in so they couldn't leave. So don't think that that guru or cult leader had some magic thing. He was just pulling the plug or let's say inserting every plug to push every button of fear and anxiety by those types of things. Um, I often have to work with families to get them to realize that when you've left a cult, you want to break with that group. And that they're not a jolly bunch of boys and girls that are just coming to call. They want your body to take it back to the factory to turn out more boots, more fancy jackets, uh, to sell courses, whatever. And I have to sometimes be extremely firm with parents and families telling them that you don't say to the person that's just left a cult, but they're your friends, they're calling, you've got to talk with them. You know, I, I look at these parents that keep saying, well, why not? They stayed with them six years, they must have liked them. And I think, uh, that I better start all over again. And I get the ex-cultist to sit there and say, do you mind if I tell your mother and your father or whoever it is that they're living with that wants them get on the phone every time the good old cult calls? And then the other thing is you have to prevent people that have just recently left the cult from going back to rescue their brother, their husband, their wife, their child. Have them take enough time that they're in real good shape and really in charge of their decision making before they think about that. And how to help people respond to these messages that the uh, cult leader keeps sending them. Um, also, I will now fuss at the therapists and pastors <laughs> who don't understand cult life. Be very careful about staying in therapy with certain types of therapists. Be very careful of therapists who don't really know about cults, who don't know how dissociation is produced, who don't know the effects of hyperventilation, who don't know the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder in the variants you see it in these things, who don't recognize panic disorders and blame you. They want to know why you were motivated to seek out the very cult that got you. And the therapist will say, you must have had a lot of unmet dependency needs. Bah, the cult was very good at recruiting. <laughs> you were looking to do something good for the world or yourself. You just happened to meet a really organized and usually deceptive recruiter. Certain therapists keep blaming your masochism. First, they tell you it's your dependency. Secondly, they tell you you have streaks of masochism that they have to fix. And if they don't get you to stay in therapy to fix those two things, then they start what I call parent bashing, saying, oh, your parents, they caused it. And we now have a whole flock of therapists who are inducing false memories in people by telling them you know, it was the dear old dad and mother must have been hidden Satanists, and they hypnotized you so that you don't remember, but dear old dad really abused you years ago, and your mother stood there passively and allowed it to happen. And not only do we have a surge of those kind of uninformed therapists, there are a group of them that are telling their clients that they were kidnapped when they were little by space aliens. And a psychiatry professor from Harvard has written an introduction to a booklet 
that's been put out saying be sure and check your clients and patients for signs of alien abductions. So uh, when people seek psychiatric and psychological help after being in a cult, they need psychoeducational explanations of what happened. Now, let me kick the pastors around a bit. <laughs> Luckily, those of you that are here are among my favorite people because you understand there really are cults out there and that they're not all good and fine groups. But I have had to help so many people check around and try to find a priest, a rabbi, a clergyman who understood that a cult leader could actually get a person to marry someone they didn't know and then they come out and they go back to their old church and the pastor says, eh, it was your willfulness and they don't want to hear and this person really needs tremendous counseling and in churches whose belief systems are not in favor of multiple marriages, this poor person has to clergy hop till he finds a person that will hear out the story of what happened in the uh, cult because people have been induced to marry people they had never seen before, not only in massive ceremonies that you see on TV, but in small cultic ceremonies. Also, people, when they want to talk to pastors from their old world, when they come out, have to tell the pastor that while they were in Brand X cult, they were encouraged to have incest with their children and to have their children have child-to-child -child sex. And I want to say that I've been on a number of the Christian network stations. And I am so pleased with most of the interviewers on those programs who say to me when they get me on, Dr. Singer, you know we have so many callers who say that if a person just knew enough about the Bible or their faith or the Koran or the Talmud or the Torah, cults would never get them. And the interviewer says, I know that's not true. There's no use arguing theology with a cultist. They need help in understanding the social and psychological ways they were led into and kept in that group. And I would just love to send letters of endorsement to some of those interviewers I talked with during the Waco period who really knew it isn't the theology. Cults are not all religious in nature. And that what is needed is an understanding and a discussion about the psychological and social manipulations. Now, uh, last night I talked with some of the members about back to the triggers. One of the best things to do is be sure you have a friend you can talk with now that you're out of the group. Someone, when they notice that you sort of space out, will offer you companionship, not psychotherapy, just listening time. And they'll divert you into an activity. Also, as a farmer cultist, if you've just spaced out and some of your family or friends want you to talk about it and you don't feel you can at the moment, learn to say, I don't want to talk about that right now, please. Learn to respect your own fragility and as part of your cult recovery, be in charge of when you respond to who, about what. Um, there's a myth in our society that talking everything out is the only way to cure. And last year I told the focus people, forget it. If other things work better for you, there's nothing quite so good as suppressing something. You don't have to let your feelings out. I would have gotten in trouble years ago if I'd let my feelings out. I would have said rude things to lawyers when I was on the stand. <laughs> uh, 
Also, those of you that are farmer cultists as well as regular people, there's <laughs> n <laughs> nothing wrong with avoiding things. When you're walking through a corridor, there was not a stone carving brought down with the Ten Commandments that said, you have to respond to everybody on the street that tries to speak to you. That was not written in stone. Put your eyes forward and go past people. Do not engage. Step one, so that you can suppress your feelings, you can avoid getting in all kinds of things. When something floods up inside you, minimize it a bit. Say, I'm not going crazy, I'm just a little anxious. Learn to minimize some of these grizzlies that come up from the old days. And the thing that we talked about last night, and I've gotten remarks from a number of you in the corridors, it was helpful already. How to divert. If you dissociate, meaning you psychologically disengage, you're gone mentally. How do you get back? As Mickey Mouse, as quaint as it sounds, get some sensory change. Give yourself a tiny pinch. No one will know you're doing it. Break up that being caught. The moment you feel hung up in a dissociated state, give yourself a tiny pinch. Rub your hand, something that gets some sensory input that may break up that being on hold and dissociate it. The other thing is that I told people last night, see if I focus my attention way far back there, I'm really doing it deliberately. If I'm looking at my finger up close, I'm really in charge. When people space out and dissociate, they sort of let their eyes roam and space out and focus on middle distance. Those of you that are parents and friends and spouses, brothers, sisters, that don't have an idea of what people are talking about, about uh, floating, dissociating, try it. Let your eyes sort of go roving loose and sort of focus into middle distance, not up close, not off there. That gets you as close a feeling of what dissociating is like as I can describe for people. For those of you that space out, anything that gets your attention up close and some competing sensory thing seems to break up the dissociation. Anything you do to divert helps break up that flooding of emotion and emotional memories that come in if you're suffering more from being in a high aversive arousal group. Um, Having been a teacher for a little over 50 years, I always over-prepare. <laughs> and I can tell we're getting toward the time. I want you to know there's a whole bunch of very important and even humorous stuff we aren't going to get to. <laughs> that I will, at some point, I promise, get it all written down so one can read. Because um, it's fun preparing to come and share and talk with you. And I so enjoy being here, not just because of that wonderful standing ovation, but the fact that you don't space out very much while I talk. <laughs> <laughs> so that what I'd like to do now, if you have some questions, we will read them off and make some responses to them. I'll just read this one and as I go along we'll get an answer. Do you know why I desire to talk to my old cult friends? One in particular until he would no longer have control over me. It was like a challenge that I needed to conquer. When I dissociate my world becomes gray and loses importance as well as beauty. Just for your information. That's a very frequent description of people dissociating and thinking they're in a gray corridor or that there's sort of a gray fog between them and anything cheerful or colorful. 
Thank you so much. That's true. Now, why in heaven's name uh, would you want to go back and talk to your old cult friends, one in particular, until he could no longer have control over me? It was like a challenge I needed to conquer. All of us hearing that can understand. If you've been controlled for a long time, you want to check it out like an athlete wants to pit himself or herself against a standard. How fast can they do the breaststroke? How fast can they run? You want your independence back, and you think, if I can just talk to that guy that controlled me, I will get my independence back because he got it. Let me break up that myth work out here with other people practicing on sensing your own self. Self-esteem and decision-making on your own are almost synonymous. So there's no use going back to try to get that guy to give you a sense of control. You already have started on the path when you think you want to go do it, but practice on somebody that's nearby that will be more reciprocal and more responsive and not be stuck in the cult mentality of having to control you. See, out here we take turns. We even take turns now as much as I love to be a teacher. <sighs> Is it typical to regress or to be reluctant to rid self of some of the physical trappings of the cult. What do you suggest to once and for all to separate the self? Uh, let me tell you sad stories. Don't throw everything away from your old cult days in case you decide to sue them. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, and I'm not saying, you know, go to court all the time, but I know a number of people in this room who themselves are relatives chucked out all their documents that then, when the cult started after them and being really punitive toward them legally, they didn't have the documents. They had been chucked out into the dumpster behind the home or the apartment building. My suggestion to people is pack up your memorabilia Pack up your sari, uh, your gong, whatever your group had, and put it in a carton and put it in a storage place so that you don't get triggered and remembered every day. But decide what to do with it when you are fully, fully away from the cult, fully in charge of your own life. And I want you to know, and I want to thank all of you, I have an extensive extensive library of books from all kinds of cultic groups that help me in my work and that I can loan to people that need these books from your old cult so that uh, if you no longer want all those red and green bound volumes, you know, <laughs> uh, there are many of us that can use them for various things. But make that decision slowly when and what to chuck, but do get it out of constantly reminding you. I have always wanted to know what you thought of the movie The Manchurian Candidate. The Manchurian Candidate was great fiction, but it has nothing to do with how thought reform, coercive persuasion, mind control works. Nobody has ever said that coercive persuasion and thought reform programs make you into a zombie that acts on a cue, looks into a candle, etc., etc. That's a movie for fun to watch it, but it makes fodder for the um, cults who try to say there is no such thing as coercive persuasion. They try to say all of the work that Lifton and Shine and Dr. West and I and others did during the Korean War said you could only coerce people with gun at the head in a prison setting. That's a big lie. So that, yes, I want to write an article or a book called Yes, Virginia, There Is Thought Reform. Because... <laughs> 
The people in this room know it exists. The courts know it exists. And in spite of what some of the handlers of people who are here in the corridors are being told, no court in this land has said that there is no such thing as coercive persuasion. No real academics have said it. And those of us that are suing two of the large associations are suing them not on that issue, but because of in-house chicanery that a few of their members did. But you may go away knowing that nobody other than the guy who created the book and the movie, The Manchurian Candidate, thinks coercive persuasion and thought reform produces that. For centuries, mankind has used various techniques to persuade other people. During the Korean War and earlier in China, programs got packaged to attack the political self of people and shift them over to the way Mao wanted them to be. A variant of that as an intense indoctrination program was used during the Korean War. And what we're seeing now is what Professor Offshi and I call the second generation of thought reform, meaning not Manchurian candidate stuff, but what you all know exists, a step at a time, changing you without you being aware of what the agenda is that the person running the thought reform program has in mind for you. So the Manchurian candidate is entertainment, but very misleading in terms of what is coercive persuasion. Are there time-related definable stages that walk away former members go through? List possible stages. The first stage most people seem to be into me is they simply look stunned. They are really feeling adrift. Because most walkaways have to pick a time when it looks safe. I've had people tell me that they walked away after 10, 15, 20 years in certain groups when during the middle of the night they noticed there wasn't an armed guard at the door of the compound. They didn't know where they were going, they just knew for a long time they were going to leave. And the opportunity was there and they left. Others have had to plan, and there are many walkaways here, you had to plan, and the first stage for the walkaways is this stunned feeling of, I left a whole organized life back there, now what do I do? And there was one poor soul came out of one of these high control groups that she'd been in for years and years and years, and a very dutiful lady, I've never met her, but she was so thought reformed, that guess what, she went, to the airport, she bought her ticket. She calls up the home base to tell the uh, head honcho she's leaving. <laughs> and where she's going, I mean, the woman is truly brainwashed. This gentleman rented an airplane right away and met her and picked her up before she could get to family or anybody at the place where she was going. She was literally that obedient. She was still in that stunned state and didn't know how to think ahead. So that that first stage of being stunned is then followed by how do I go about making a plan of any kind? And I've worked with many walkaways that have not met exit counselors. And again, as Mickey Mouse as it may sound, I have them and I give them a tablet and a pencil and I say, let's plan what you're going to do the rest of the day. And I tell them, you must buy an alarm clock and you set the clock the night before. In spite of the fact these people may have more IQ than I have, be many years younger and in more vigorous health, that second stage of how do I make a plan comes after the stun, stun state. And then people diverse 
diversify at this point as far as I can tell. And I'd like to put more time in and maybe next year have with Paul Martin and others of you that are looking at it systematically variants of the walk away. I want you to know that I also get calls from relatives of walkaways who say, my son has been holed up in a room here in our house for three years since he walked away from Brand X cult. He won't go out, he won't go to work, I can't get him to see a doctor, what should I do? Now that's a tough one. And there are a whole bunch of lost souls holed up in parental homes and the parents just feel stymied. There are some that I've met out on the streets as street people in San Francisco because they had no home to go to and they're just out on the street. So that after stunned, then how do I make decisions and then all kinds of problems of what those decisions involve. Sometimes I've had to call parents for an ex-cultist that either the police have dropped off nicely in front of my house, um, saying this lady will help you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've had to call parents and tell them that their young lady daughter of 31 or 32 is here, doesn't have bus fare to get to Brand X town. And they say, oh, she's just running that number again. She gives the money to the guru. We're not going to give her a ticket. And bang, goes the phone. So I dial them back, collect. You know, they get one phone call on mine. Then I call them, collect. And I say, you haven't heard the whole story. And then I start really trying to induce a little guilt. Will they please listen to the kid that the kid, now 31, is really, really out. And I'm glad to say that none of the ones where I called and did a guilt trip on the parents <laughs> did that person take the ticket and uh, turn it into money and give it to the guru or anything. They honestly went home. And uh, one of the ladies that I helped is not here because she's busy uh, uh, following her graduate career elsewhere. And uh, that was how I first made connection with International B'nai B'rith. The Moonies were dumping a lot of kids out on the roadway not too far from where I live, and the highway patrol brought some of these people down and again said, that lady will talk with you. <laughs> and I thought, well, since I couldn't find their parents on the phone, I knew this phrase, B'nai B'rith. So, you know, I'd look it up and call and uh, got them to try to help and so on so that uh, next year I'll have more of a schedule of pathways. We have many, many more questions, but unfortunately our time is over and Dr. Singer will be here most of the weekend. Maybe you can ask her questions directly. Thank you, Margaret.